Great evening, everyone, and happy Black History Month to each of you as we acknowledge and celebrate the unmatched contributions of African Americans in this country and in the world. I am Dr. Karen Owens, adjunct faculty and director of strategic research at Hood Theological Seminary. Welcome to our first session in this six week series on the politics of Jesus, facilitated by Dr. Overy Hendricks, PhD. Over these next few weeks, we will explore the political dimensions of Jesus's ministry and their crucial implications for the church. And we are so honored and elated that Dr. Hendricks will yeah, be I'm with us over these next few weeks. Yes, so I'll share just a little about him. And I'm gonna ask if you are not muted to please mute your device at this time. Dr. Hendricks is the visiting scholar in the departments of religion and African and African diaspora studies at Columbia University. He's Professor Emeritus at New York Theological Seminary in New York, New York, and pres former president of Payne Theological Seminary in Wilberforce, Ohio. Moreover, he's a former distinguished senior fellow at the Democracy Collaborative in Washington, DC. And Dr. Hendricks is the author of several books, The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus's Teachings, and how they've been corrupted. And of course, we'll use that book in the series, Christians Against Christianity, How Right-Wing Evangelicals Are Destroying Our Nation and Our Faith, another book we'll use in this series. He's also written a book titled Living Water and The Universe Bends Toward Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic. And more information about Dr. Hendricks can be found on his website, aubreyhendricksphd.com. Now at this time, the president of Hood Theological Seminary, Dr. Virgil Lattimore will extend a welcome. Dr. Lattimore. Thank you, Dr. Owens and for uh... Uh, that wonderful introduction of, of our speaker. Good evening, colleagues and friends of Hood Theological Seminary. I'm, I'm the senior servant of this institution that bears the name of the religious leader who was a prototype follower of the religion of Jesus. Bishop James Walker Hood believed that faith should guide its citizens to be responsibly engaged in lifting the oh, faith so uh, and and to guide no, us responsibly in uh, the, uh, upgrading, upgrading our education, the well-being, and the integrity of its people. He was active in human rights as well as social justice. He participated in the writing of the Charter of the State of North Carolina and was the first Black superintendent of schools. We welcome you to this six-part series led by Dr. Oberry Hendricks, which is supported by a grant from the Lilly Endowment. Dr. Hendricks is a scholar and a lifelong uh, follower and advocate for social justice. He is superbly qualified as a guru on how the religion of Jesus intersects with the political evolutions and the economy in America. We know that his insights and analysis will be evocative and illuminating. Family, we value your presence uh, at this seminar, and we encourage you to explore our many programs and activities at our friendly website at www.hoodseminary.edu. Thank you, Dr. Owens. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore. Now, before we begin, just a few reminders. We remain so very grateful for this tremendous turnout. And so therefore it's important that you please keep your devices muted throughout the entire session. And following each session, the recording will be sent to your email addresses. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in the chat. As Dr. Lattimore indicated, this free course offering is presented via the Pathways for Tomorrow Initiative 
of the Lilly Endowment Incorporated. And I also want to thank Dr. Lattimore again, Mr. John Everett, Ms. Kelly Bryant, and Ms. Sandra Oliver for their valued assistance and support. And so at this time, I would now turn it over to Dr. Hendricks. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, very glad to be here. Um, I hope this lighting is fine. I'm coming to you from a hotel room in Atlanta. And the next week I'll be coming from a hotel room in Washington, DC, so I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to get right to it. Our time is short. So, um, Dr. Lattimore, I'm not going to get into the, you know, to the African Methodist uh, protocols that we usually have that are, you know, 10 minutes long. I'm just going to get straight to it. So, okay. Thank you. I'm going to begin by reading a couple excerpts um, just to set the tone um, from the politics of Jesus. <clears throat> Pardon me. I was raised on the blind, bland Jesus of Sunday school and of my mother's gentle retellings, the meek, mild Jesus who told us in a nice, passive, sentimental way to love our enemies and who assured us that we need not worry about our troubles, just bring them to him. He was a gentle, serene, non-threatening Jesus whose only concern was getting believers into heaven and whose only transgression was to claim sonship with God. Act so obvious to my family that we were sure even a blind man could see its truth. That was the Jesus I knew. Reinforcing that perception were the renderings of him in my church, in my home, and in the homes of relatives and friends. Even in the images adorning the little cardboard fans we used to swat away the sweltering heat at the height of worship, with uh, showing Jesus with his head meekly tilted. Soft hands bent limply at the wrist or clasped tightly in prayer, eyes downcast uh, or beatifically turned upward, but never so bold as to look anyone in the eye. Then there was the famous blue-eyed Jesus by Warner Salmon, the most popular and most fanciful image of him, which I, like most folks I knew, thought to be an exact likeness of the Lord. The Scandinavian features and the clipped beard and carefully quaffled, not to mention the piercing blue eyes of the portrait, gave Simon's a Jesus a, no, a nobility that assured all who gazed upon him that the last thing he would do was cause trouble or upset anyone's needs. Anyone except a few greedy Pharisees, whom we children hated without having a clue to what a Pharisee was, an evil priest who certainly did deserved it anyway, as far as we knew. I prayed to that Jesus daily, called out his name in times of trouble, loved him because he first loved me and because he gave his life so the devil would not get my soul. Yet for all my trust and love and fervor, something in the, in the portrayals of Jesus and his message did not seem quite right. Something just didn't make sense. Was this meek, mild Jesus, the same Jesus who defiantly called the Pharisees a brood of vipers? and described them as whitewashed tombs full of every unclean thing? Was this the same outraged Jesus who, swinging a fearsome stick, set the temple bunny chain just to flight? And if he was so meek and mild, how could he get anyone's interest in the first place? Much less hold the attention of thousands at a time and effortlessly get tough guys to follow him, like the Apostle James, who was so rough and blustery that he was nicknamed Son of Thunder. And what did Jesus mean by sayings like, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword? I tried my best to understand, although questions like those were frowned on by my parents and every believer I, I knew as evidence of weak faith, or worse, of the devil's confusion. But Jesus of Nazareth was a revolutionary. It's my contention. Now, to say that he was political, though, doesn't mean that he sought to start yet another protest party in Galilee, nor does it mean that he was in, involved in politics in the sense that we know it today, with his bargaining and compromises and power plays and partisanship. And it certainly doesn't mean that he wanted to wage war or overthrow the Roman Empire by force. 
To say that Jesus was a political revolutionary is to say that the message he proclaimed not only called for change in individual hearts, but also demanded sweeping and comprehensive change in the political, social, and economic structures in his setting in, in life, which was colonized Israel. It means that if Jesus had his had, had his way, the Roman Empire and the ruling elites among his own people would no longer have held their positions of power. Or if they did, they would have had to conduct themselves very, very differently. It means that an important goal of his ministry was to radically change the distribution of authority and power, goods and resources. So all people, particularly the little people, or the least of these, as Jesus called them, so all people might have lives free of political repression, enforced hunger and poverty, and undue insecurity. It means that Jesus not only sought to heal people's pain, but also to inspire and empower people to remove the unjust social and political structures that too often were the cause of their pain. It means that Jesus had a clear and unambiguous vision of the healthy world that God intended and that he addressed any issue, social, economic, or political, that violated that vision. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but just consider just a few examples from the Gospels. In what the Gospel of Luke portrays as the inaugural sermon of Jesus' ministry, Jesus announces that the reason for his anointing by God and the purpose of his min mission in the world are one and the same, to proclaim radical, economic, social, and political change. <clears throat> In Luke 14, he wrote, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In this passage, Jesus, Luke's Jesus leaves no doubt as to the radicality of his calling. First, he heralded good news to the poor. The Greek word for poor here means collective or class identity. That is to say, he announced that the reason for his ministry was the struggle for radical change in the circumstances and the institutions that kept people downtrodden and impoverished. And yes, radical change, because only radical change could make a real difference in their plight. <clears throat> he also announced release to the captives, that is to those unjustly imprisoned, which was a declaration of major proportions because Roman jails were full of political prisoners, those reduced to, to penury by economic exploitation. Then he made the ultimate political pronouncement. He announced liberation to those who were oppressed by the crushing weight of empire. Not bruised, as some translations render it, um, but oppressed from the Greek word thrao, which means oppressed, crushed. Jesus ended this in inaugural sermon by proclaiming the acceptable, acceptable year of the Lord, which is an allusion to the year of Jubilee, the end of a 50 year cycle when all land that had been confiscated or otherwise unjustly acquired was to be returned to its original owners. When read in the context of his times, Jesus' sermon had the ring of a manifesto. It is the pronouncement of his divine struggle for, that is, to bring economic, political, and social justice to his people. It is difficult to make a more radical polit political statement than this. So my brothers and sisters, I, I just wanted to read this as a, sort of a, to set the stage for our next, uh, our next, next few weeks, um, in which we will be talking about the politics of Jesus. Um, and what I'm going to, uh, to talk about today are the, the factors that help shape Jesus' worldview, okay? And it's important, uh, and next week we're going to talk about the ethical foundations. But, and uh, anything we don't get to this week, though, we'll, 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 we'll get to next week. It's important to keep in mind that Jesus was, while he walked the earth, Jesus was a man like any other man, like any other human being who was uh, affected and subject to the social, political, and economic conditions of his setting in life. It's important to keep that in mind because some folk seem to think sometimes that Jesus was not a man, like, you know, what happened around him didn't affect him. 
uh, but the scriptures doesn't, uh, do not say that, don't give us that impression at all, just the opposite. And um, there are two overarching factors, I would say, that help to shape uh, Jesus' worldview or his political consciousness. And the first is the legacy of the Judaism he inherited. And the, the second factor, overarching factor, is the politics of his own uh, time. The first, we talk about the legacy of Jesus' Jewishness. We must remember Jesus was Jewish. He was you know, totally a Jew. And um, you know, we, we see him, he refers to Moses a lot. We see him going to make the, make the, um, the pilgrimage to J Jerusalem. He refers to the scriptures. He even said that he came to fulfill. So he was Jewish. That's important because we have to see him in that context. And when we see him in the context of uh, the legacy of Judaism, um, we see that, that at every important moment in the history of Judaism um, is something that is reflected in Jesus' ministry. Now, where did our faith begin? Well, there were faith, people who would talk about, you know, in Genesis, they talk about Abraham, and they'll talk about Joseph or some others. Um, some might even go back to Adam. I'm not sure how that works out. But um, uh, the root event of our faith really is the Exodus event. We say it's the root event of our faith because it's at that point that God speaks to a people and not just in and it is the root event of our faith uh, because it is at that point where God spoke to uh spoke to the people and said that he was going to deliver them from their oppression he said I've heard you on account of your oppression I think that's in Exodus 13. I have heard you on account of your oppression. Now, he didn't say, I, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming to help you Hebrews uh, because you are so religious and you all sang so well or anything like that. No, no, no. He said that uh, because um, this is Exodus 3. I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their... Uh, cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them, to deliver them. That's an important thing to keep in mind. This is where our whole notion of deliverance comes from. And, and, and because the Jews in those days and through most of the Bible, most of the, uh, the Old Testament, um, they did not believe in an afterlife. In fact, the Sadducees in the New Testament didn't believe in an afterlife. So, when they talked about deliverance, they're talking about deliverance from oppression in this life, in this world. Um, that's very important to keep, keep in mind. <clears throat> um, God responds to the Hebrews. The Hebrew is not a religious term. It is a, 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 a class term. It refers to, to, uh, to an oppressed class. Hebrew from the uh, the Semitic word uh, hapru means uh, one who crossed over, one who's outside. So the Hebrews uh, were exploited workers who were outside the political economy, the mainstream of, of, of Israel. They were marginalized, marginalized as, as exploited workers. God was responding to class oppression, the oppression of an exploited and enslaved class. Um, it's important to, to, to acknowledge that because Jesus in his manifesto in Luke 4 says that um, the reason that he is anointed or the reason he was made a Messiah was to bring good news to the poor, but also to bring liberation to the oppressed. So he's reflecting the, uh, the Exodus principle in the very first uh, uh, sermon, uh, first public sermon in, in which he tells the world who and what he is about. Um, very, very important to keep that in mind. Our, the root event of our faith is the Exodus event, which was a liberation 
event. And then an, uh, another moment, I'm not, you don't have time to, to, to get into it in depth, but if you're reading the politics, uh, read the politics of Jesus, I get into it in depth. Well, the next moment we see is the period of the judges. And uh, I'm not going to say much about that, uh, other than judges is uh, a translation of the Hebrew mishpatim, which comes from the Hebrew word mishpat or justice. And judges mean those who do justice, those who did justice, right? Or those who judge between good and evil, um, bad and good. But they were folk who worked for justice. It has nothing to do with religiosity um, because um, Samson was a judge and he wasn't exactly the most religious person that you can think of. In fact, he's not even remembered for being religious. He remembered for striking a blow against the oppression of his people. I know I get an amen on that, but I know y'all got uh, y'all a block, so leave it block. Uh, but um, so that is. So and what's important from the period of the judges, there are a number of things that are important uh, for the period of the judges um, in terms of looking at the Judaism that, that uh, Jesus uh, is a legacy of. But one thing that's important, a couple of things that come out of that that are important is um, this notion of the kingdom of God. That comes from, well, in the New Testament, it's translated from the Greek, Basileia to Theu, but initially it comes from a Hebrew term, Malkut Shemayim, which means the sole sovereignty of the heavens or the sole sovereignty of God, because they didn't use the name of God. They thought it was too, too holy. But we get a sense on what um, the term means, this, this Malkut Shemayim, the sole sovereignty of God, which people translate as the kingdom of God, which is not a good translation, because it gives a sense differently of what the, the term means. We get a sense of this true meaning when in Judges 8, the Israelites asked Ju uh, Gideon of Manasseh, the judge Gideon of Manasseh, to become their hereditary king. They said, we want you to be our king and your sons after you. In other words, they said, we want to start a monarchy, a hereditary monarchy, and you'll be at the head of it. And Gideon said, <clears throat> so I'll read, I'll read the scripture. Then the Israel side to Gideon, Wait a minute, let me just mute this. I to, you know, him to. Please, please block. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you and your son and your grandson also. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord alone will rule over you. So this notion of the kingdom of God really means the sole sovereignty of God. Only God has the right to uh, to lord it over, uh, to rule. Uh, this becomes important um, in, in Jesus' ministry, uh, particularly when he uses the term kingdom of God in the Lord's Prayer, for instance. But this notion of the kingdom of God um, from the Hebrew, the, it was so radical that it was used as a battle cry. When the Jews went in, into battle to defend their people. They would say, Malkos Shemayim, Malkos Shemayim. Only God has a right to rule. No man has the right to dominate over others. Much like Muslims would say, La Wakbar, La Wakbar, as a war cry. Show you how radical it is. Now, we've changed it into something that's really Meltosi, uh, uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a radical, um, it's a, a, a radical, concept that says there should be no dictators and that anyone who's going to rule over the people must rule according to the ethical vision of the Bible, which we'll talk about next week. Jesus reflects this, um, this whole notion of the kingdom of God. He refers to the kingdom of God a lot, a lot. And sometimes, I mean, if one looks at John 18, for instance, where Jesus, Jesus says to Pilate, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Well, you know, many folk get the impression that means that the kingdom is over yonder somewhere. But I mean, when when Jesus says that, he's really only in, indicating that um, when he says that my kingdom is not of this world, he's saying that the true sovereignty comes from God, not from Caesar. It doesn't come from anyone on earth. So he's not talking about over yonder necessarily. But when we look at the Lord's Prayer, it becomes even clearer because Jesus says, um, 
and we'll talk more about this later uh, in a few sessions, but Jesus talked about when his disciples asked um, what their prayers should be concerned about, one thing he said was to pray for that thy kingdom come. Pray to God, thy kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done, which is a very, very radical and dangerous thing to say when Caesar's kingdom is already there. And in fact, that was seen as sedition against the state, which was a capital crime punishable by crucifixion. And crucifixion uh, was, uh, was reserved only for seditionists against the state. It was a political uh, crucifixion. We'll talk about that more anyway. But when Jesus says, disciples pray, um, your kingdom come, your will be done. In other words, um, they're praying to God to replace Caesar's kingdom with God's kingdom, God's soul sovereignty. That gives a sense of just how radical that, that is and how dangerous um, that notion of the soul sovereignty of God is or the kingdom of God. Um, I'm going to move sort of quickly, so I hope folk are, are, are following me. If, if you are, would just raise your hand so I can know if you're following me. All right, thank you. All right. What also comes out of this, out of the period of the judges is very important, is the notion of Messiah. The notion of Messiah. Um, Messiah and, and Son of God are not the same thing at all. Um, Messiah comes out of uh, the Hebrew Bible um, when um, Saul was anointed as king, but Saul was anointed as the first Moshiach or the first Messiah. It, Messiah means anointed. The first Messiah was Saul, King Saul. And... Um, And King Saul's, you all forgive me, I've been traveling and I'm getting over COVID, uh, long COVID, so I I get a little, uh, I won't say confused, but I, I, my mind's not moving as quickly as it, as it usually does. Um, but, but, you know, we see how radical this whole notion of, of Messiah was. We see that Messiah was a political notion, not a religious um, notion. We see it in the charge that the prophet Samuel gives to Saul when he anoints Saul as the first Messiah. He says, the Lord has anointed you, made you Messiah, has anointed you ruler over his people Israel. You shall rule over the people of the Lord, and listen to this, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies all around. The job of the Messiah is to struggle for, to try to make sure that the people are liberated. His concern is to be about the liberation uh, and the security of the people. Let me read that again. The Lord has anointed you ruler over his people, Israel. You shall reign over the people of the Lord and, I uh, do like some preachers say, hey, watch this, watch this, watch this. And you will save them from the hand of your enemies all around. So we know that Jesus, um, the beginning of the very first line of the Gospel of Mark, calls him Jesus Messiah. Uh, he was heralded as the Messiah. And that's different from Son of God. The, the Messiah is to struggle for his people. And we see that he says in, in this uh, manifesto in Luke 4, that that's why he came, to bring good news to his people. What's good news to the people? That the institutions, the laws, the, the structures that govern their lives, that they will be, that they will be changed in, from unjust structures to, to just political structures, political structures of, of justice. So, I'm going to jump to, to another important moment. There are others, but you know we're going to. Uh, I'll deal with the most important moment. The next moment I want to look at in the legacy of, of Judaism that the, the, to which uh, Jesus is heir is the period of the prophets, essentially eighth period, uh, century BC. Now, prophecy 
you know, those of us who who, uh, who uh, remember, what was that West Indian woman who had uh, Psychic Friends Network? Um, they, uh, <laughs> they portray prophecy as foretelling the future. And we have some preachers calling themselves prophets and prophetesses. Um, and uh, they say about foretelling the future. So, yes, thank you, Sister Brooks. Miss Cleo and her Psychic Friends Network. But there are two parts of what prophecy is in, the, in the biblical prophecy. First is forth telling. This is the most important part. Speaking forth truth to power. Standing up against the forces of oppression. Um, and, and, and misinformation that mislead people and exploit people. That's the first, and, and the prophets will say, thus saith the Lord, you are doing thus and so to my people, you are doing thus and so to my people, and that's not right. And then you get the second part of prophecy, which is, is foretelling. And if you don't stop, then thus and so is going to happen to you. The two parts of prophecy then are foretelling, speaking truth to power, um, and the second is, uh, as a result, foretelling. Foretelling what's going to happen if you don't uh, obey, if those in power do not obey the word of the Lord. And uh, this is a, this is an important thing to keep in mind in terms of understanding biblical biblical prophecy because you know we have a lot of folks out out here talking about the biblical prophecy. And uh, they seem not to know uh, what they're talking about. Um, and often they're lining their pockets. I'm not mentioning uh, any names, but I've been seeing this prophetess uh, a lot, asking for a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and then the stuff she says, it just seems to me sort of outrageous, but that's not what I'm here for. So. So the, the role of prophet, I guess M Moses started the role, uh, was the first one who fulfilled the role of a prophet um, when he took God's commission to speak out against the injustices of Pharaoh and the uh, uh, and the Egyptian uh, Egyptian people. Um, and uh, we give some, some examples, of course, of the of prophetic language um, from Jeremiah. It said, but your eyes and heart are only on your dishonest gain for shedding innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence. That's forth telling. Um, Micah, alas for those, from the book of Micah, alas for those who devise wickedness and evil deeds on their beds because it is in their power. They cover the fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They oppress householder and house people in their inheritance. Um, and they also prophesied against unfair uses of laws. Um, from Isaiah, he says, uh, um, laws that with a word make a man out to be guilty and with false testimony deprive the innocent of justice. This is prophetic discourse. And they um, prophesied against corrupt economic policies. Um, for instance, from Jeremiah, woe to him who built his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice who makes his neighbors work for nothing and does not give them their wages. But their eyes and heart are only on your dishonest, but your eyes and heart are only on your dishonest gain, which seems to be a very timely critique of late capitalism. Um, that is uh, essentially the prophetic, and there's so many examples uh, we can give the prophetic, and I spent some time with that in the, pol in the politics of Jesus. But Jesus also fulfilled the office of prophet. Um, when he did the cleansing of the temple, he went in um, knocking over tables and, uh, I, well, I'm not going to say kicking butt, but he went in and uh, he raised hell um, and he spoke out against the um, exploitative pra practices of the temple. Um, and and likewise, I mean, we see him when he sp spoke against the um, uh, the Pharisees and uh, in, in Matthew 23, when he calls them, uh, uh, when he calls them, um, when he calls them out. I'll be better next week, folks. But tonight I'm a little, 
I'm out with, I've been traveling and I and as little kids said, I've been sick. So I'm 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 so I'm asking for your forbearance. Um so um Jesus modeled the prophetic for all believers, but he modeled it especially for pastors and religious leaders who are who often don't seem to realize that a part of their ministry is to stand up against structural oppression, not just treat the symptoms of oppression, uh, which is important. I mean, you know, the people's heartache and, and, and sadness and folk have so many, so many needs as a result of what goes on in society. You know, those are the symptoms of, of an oppressive society, but also have a responsibility to stand up to the causes, the structural causes. And it's so sad that so many ministers don't seem to realize that at all. There's so many ministers who don't do anything outside of their churches. So many who don't even fully use their studies to study, to understand what's going on in society. But Jesus calls us um, by his model to be prophetic, to stand up to the Sadducees and Pharisees of our time. Um, to stand up, and I'm and I, this is my opinion, but I'm saying it straight up and down. <clears throat> Follow of Jesus, I do not understand how any preacher cannot be decrying the evil onslaught from um from Donald Trump and these right-wing Christian nationalists who are, who are looking to crush our people. I will say it and stand by that any preacher who is not getting involved, trying to mobilize, trying to organize voting, or who's not trying to do anything, that they're not completely fulfilling uh, the, the calling of the gospel ministry. Um, and one might say they are guilty of, as, as uh, Reverend William Barber says, of theological malpractice. The next moment we see is in the exile. And I'm, I'm not gonna talk about that much, but um, in the exilic period, that's when the high priesthood was inaugurated. But the high priesthood that Jesus stood against was not inaugurated by the people. The high priesthood was inaugurated by the uh, Persian overlords of, uh, of the Jewish people who, who had been... Uh, Jewish people have been kidnapped, taken to Babylon, and the Persians made war in Babylon, and they repatriated the people back in, in, into Judah. And um, it was at that point, though, that they, uh, they appointed a high priest. And the high priest was appointed by the oppressors of the people. What do you think his job was? To serve the oppressors of the people. And we're told in Ezra that they started, uh, the, the priest started making um, uh, 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 sacrifices and prayers for the well-being of the emperor. And this went on, we're told by um, our witness from the first century, Josephus, that this went on until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that priests made prayers and sacrifices every day for the well-being of the emperor, the oppression of their people, oppression of their people. Give, some, give you some sense of um, what side of, of the bread the priesthoods uh, the priesthood saw, <laughs> this gives some sense to the priesthood who were serving. And, and they, their fealty overarching was to, uh, to the um, emperor. And in fact, in John 15, um, <clears throat> the priests say, we have no king but Caesar, which is, who's supposed to be their king? Their king is supposed to be God. And so that is uh that gives you some sense of of, of where the priest stood. And I, I, when we look at John 15, beginning the first verse, in there Jesus says, "You are already made clean because I've made you clean." The reason that's significant is because it was the defining practice of the priest to purify folk, to make them clean through sacrifices. That was their main job. But Jesus says in John 15, 
You don't have to go through that because I have already made you clean by my word. In other words, Jesus is saying that, that the priest, he's, he's negating their significance and their um, legitimacy. And we see that, especially in the Gospel of John, because Jesus is, it says in um, many places, um, I am the true vine. I am the good shepherd. And the Greek construction is emphatic, which means um, saying, I am, and you're not. It's contrasted. I am the good, the true vine, which meaning you're not the true vine. I am the good shepherd, meaning you priests are not the good shepherd. So this gives some sense uh, of the background, the, the Jewish background, and the legacy um, that we see uh, reflected throughout Jesus' ministry. This is very important, formative uh, factor in his ministry, in the political dimension of his ministry, and his political consciousness. Um, so I want to talk briefly about the conditions that affected the, the, the development of his political consciousness because it just come out of the air. First thing, Jesus was an oppressed colonial subject of the Roman Empire. And Howard Thurman, in his book, Jesus and the Disinherited, really, uh, he really summarizes it in a very short, pithy statement. It says, um, a Jew, if a Jew got knocked in the ditch, he was just a Jew in the ditch. If a Roman soldier knocked a Jew in the ditch, he was just a Jew in the ditch. In other words, they had no power. Um, they had no one uh, that they could speak to, no one that, that they could appeal to. They were just colonial subjects. And their main job was to give money to the empire. And uh, the Roman oppression was so brutal. There are a couple of things that, that, um, that affected Jesus. There was a town, Sepphoris, which was half day's walk from Nazareth. You could see Sepphoris from Nazareth on a clear day. There's no problem. Um, and Sephiroth had been built um, by, by Herod, as I, as I recall, um, and it was built as sort of a Hellenistic, sort of a, up, upscale, um, upscale community. Um, and these folk, because they saw themselves living in an upscale community, they thought they had some special privileges, so they wanted to be taxless, these people in the village of Sephiroth. And uh, when the Roman government did not lessen their, their taxation, they demonstrated and rioted. And what happened? Romans came in and killed hundreds of people. Josephus tells us that 3,000 people were crucified on the road between Sepphoris and Nazareth. Um, and, you know, if you know anything about this, this, this Josephus, he's, he exaggerates numbers. So, you know, let's say it was 300, or let's say it was 30 people only who were crucified on this road um, between Sepphoris and Nazareth. Can you imagine the horror of that? 30 people crucified and the Romans wouldn't let them take, anyone take them down? And people didn't die right away like Jesus died. Jesus died mercifully quickly on, on the cross. Um, we're told that sometimes people lived up to two weeks nailed to the cross. So imagine what that's like. They're nailed to the cross they're moaning, screaming, defecating, urinating. Imagine the stench. And then when they died, the Romans would not let people take their bodies down. So we had this, so imagine the horror that went on. This went on a few years before Jesus' birth. Well, think about when Emmett Till was killed, how we saw Emmett Till's body and how it still hor it horrifies us. Think about how it horrified and frightened the whole nation of 20 million African Americans. Now think about this little village of, of Nazareth that Jesus was born in, and and was raised. Well, he was raised in Nazareth. Imagine that, um, how that would permeate the fabric of their lives. They saw 30 folk lynched, at least 30 folks lynched, tortured to death. Think of what that did to the psyche of this this people. Think about how long they talk about it. Think about, look how long we talk about Emmett Till. It still permeates black, um, black culture. So Jesus grew up with this kind of, um, this, this sense of 
of overarching Roman of, um, uh, in his life, and it had to affect him. I know that um, the picture of Emmett Till affected me growing up. Um, moreover, there was uh, you might be familiar, familiar with Franz Fanon, the uh, the, uh, the writer of The Wretched of the Earth. He was a Martinican um, psychiatrist who was an employee of, of the uh, French military in his brutal, brutal colonial um, in, uh, occupation of Rome, I mean, of Algeria, rather. And uh, Franz Fanon, he noticed in, in, in treating people that were brought in by the soldiers, um, you know, th that were supposed to be crazy, he realized that they what he identified as reactionary psychoses to colonial oppression. And when we, when I read these psychoses, I thought he was talking about the New Testament because he says the first thing that happens is that women, women's menstrual cycles are interrupted under the brutality of Roman colonial occupation. Uh, we know we see that in the New Testament, right? Several times. Um, he said, then we also see hysterical, uh, hysterical paralysis uh, that, that, that at times people are so, 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 so frightened and so afraid that, that they become paralyzed uh, be, because that, they would think that their psyche tells them that makes them less of a target or, uh, or they're afraid to go into battle. Or, 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 or you know, some other mind, some other mind mechanisms, um, and of course, malnutrition cause cause uh, you know uh, paralysis, uh, paralysis and lameness. We know that, um, but also there are these psychological processes, and one one stands out. Um, he said there was a young man. He said there was a young man who was um, self hating and self destructive. He was always trying to hurt himself. He hated himself, and Franz Fanon and treating him with, with therapy, he came to realize the, the reason this young man was self-hating and self-destructive is because he was so uh, ashamed that he could not protect his people from the horror of the French occupation of Algeria. And it was horrible. I mean, uh, torture was institutionalized and widespread. So, why is that significant? Well, if you look at the fifth chapter of Mark, there is a young man who is self-hating and self-destructive, living in the tombs. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because we're told that the reason for the man's self-hatred and his uh, self-destruction is that he is occupied by a demon called Legion. And then this demon says, do not send us out of the country. Then we realize, wait, a Legion that occupied the country? Well, the man then first is not a man at all, but he's a representative character because what we're told is that this Legion can only be the Roman Legion. And it's a Roman Legion that occupied this, the country that caused this terrible um, uh, crime rate. And and uh, and terrible horror and pain, and we're going to talk about that um, in in a, a few se sections, uh, hence. But I want to give a sense of how of of how horrible this Roman oppression is, and and the effect it would have on people, and the effect it had on on Jesus. And we'll see how Jesus responded um, to this oppression uh, in his in his ministry. Um, <clears throat> In terms of economic factors, Jesus talked about the poor and about poverty more than anything other than God. Um, and that is because poverty was rampant. Poverty was so rampant that the uh, rabbinic writings tell us that they had to be careful how they gave the poor tithe out because uh, if they weren't, people would the people were so desperate, they would stampede like cattle. And those are the words they use, stampede like cattle. Um, the people were so, so beaten down by poverty that Jesus actually had to tell them, you, you poor people are blessed. Blessed are you poor people. You don't have to tell people they're blessed unless they don't know it. 
They are so beaten down by poverty that Jesus had to lift them up. And when they asked Jesus, the disciples, what they should pray for, be concerned about, he says, we'll pray. And this was not a private prayer. This will, and we get into the prayer later, we see this was a it was a prayer for the whole people. And we're saying, he told them to pray that the people will have enough bread to eat. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because people did not have enough bread under, under Caesar. What caused their poverty? Well, one the major cause was taxation. The Romans uh, tax people to the hilt. Now, um, most of people in Israel, 95 plus percent were peasants, poor peasants, workers of the land, workers of the, of the ground. So they were, um, and peasants by definition, um, they they don't produce really any any surplus to speak of. It's really subsistence, year to year. But then on top of that, and that means they only make enough really to sustain them. But then they have to pay taxes to Rome, and Romans came around and collected their taxes. They didn't play with that, um, and then the people had to pay temple dues. And the priests collected their dues. We're told that at, at some point, when the people start weren't paying their, their temple, their tithes and offerings like they should, or like the priests wanted them to, uh, that the priests sent their servants out to collect the tithes from the threshing floor. Think about that. And um, <laughs> that's sort of crazy, isn't it? But but this taxation also caused debt, caused folk to be deeply in debt. Um, we're told that that between temple dues and the Roman taxation, sometimes they were paying out forty percent of their subsistence. So what does that mean? They had to go into debt, and debt was so significant, so horrible. That, that Jesus told his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts. And the word is philemata. Uh, it means financial debts. It doesn't mean trespasses. Trespasses are my step on your lawn. No, we mean forgive us our debts, our financial debts. That's how concerned it was. And uh, Jesus mentions debt default when people could not pay their debt. Um, as it was a, a reality that everybody knew. Uh, he, 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 in, in Matthew 18, he talks about um, uh, someone who owes a large sum to a king. Uh, and he said, as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions. He acted like this was something every day because debt slavery was every day. In fact, there was some, there was, um, in fact, there was a, um, we know of one village, well, it's in Egypt, it's the same kind of political economy, where the whole village was sold to pay off the debts of one family. Debt slavery was, was a terrible, terrible uh, reality, uh, such that when uh, the rebels destroyed the Jerusalem temple, the first thing they did was destroy the debt archives. Um, so it was no silent night, holy night, all is calm, all, all is bright. We were talking about people who were suffering. Um, and I'm going to, we're running out of time, so I'm going to just mention one other thing. Uh, and that is the marginalization of Galileans. Jesus was a Galilean. What did that mean? Well, the Galileans were the N-word of Israel. Galilee was, was uh, not in Judea. It was, uh, Galilee was um, north, um, and it was mostly farmers. And they couldn't, you know, when you have a farm, it's hard to take three, four days off to, to walk to Jerusalem, take care of uh, pilgrimage and everything, and leave your farm. So people didn't always pay their tithes. Um, and so 
of the priests had a big a big problem with that. Um, to to the point that we see it reflected in um, in Malachi when it talks about robbing God. Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings, you are cursed. In your tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. So the priests say that, <laughs> show how grieved the, the priests were, they actually put in the scripture that they were robbing God. By the way, tithing was only in uh, for the Jerusalem priesthood and support of the temple and uh, its administrators. When the temple was destroyed, tithing was no longer a biblical, uh, a, a biblical commandment or mandate. That doesn't mean tithing doesn't have its place, but we can't tell our people, you know, you're robbing God if you don't tithe. No, that's, that's a personal choice. It's a good choice, but we can't, you know, we can't make something uh, lawful that, that the scripture doesn't say is lawful. And anyone who's preaching that to the people that they're robbing God uh, I would I would ask you to to revisit that and think twice about telling that. That doesn't mean, like I said, tithing is bad. It's a good thing, um, but we can't say that it is a Christian uh, responsibility, biblical responsibility. It it is not. But also, these Galileans they, they spoke differently. They slurred their Hebrew. So, for instance, the, the priest named Eleazar, they pronounced it as Lazarus, Lazarus. So when you see Lazarus. Um, that is the Galilean slurry of of of, uh, of proper Hebrew, proper Aramaic. I mean, they would even shorten Laz, uh, Eleazar to Laz sometimes, you know. And so, <clears throat> and because they didn't tithe, uh, didn't bring their tithe and offering as as uh, regularly as the priests wanted, and, as, and also as the scripture said, the priests started treating them like they were less than human. I mean, they they called them Amharits, which means people of the land, but it really meant like somebody who was just, just worthless. I mean, they even one of the rabbinic writings says that it's okay to kill an Amharits on the most holy day, which is the Day of Atonement, um, by um, <clears throat> by cutting their, their, their spine with a knife. I mean, this is, this is how the Galileans were seen. So when Jesus stands up, He's standing up for the against the oppression of the of of all Jews, but he's also stand, speaking up for the oppression of his own Galilean uh, com compatriots. Um, I'm sorry that I've had to rush through this, but I hope I get you know my my quick thumbnail gave some sense uh, on the background of um, of Jesus, uh, the conditions and the um, uh, and the structural uh, the structural problems that Jesus uh, encountered and that helped shape uh, his political consciousness and thereby um, were the, the, some of the things that his ministry uh, came to address. And we'll see in later weeks how his ministry directly addresses. And so I'm going to... Uh, and uh, ended here. Next week, we're going to begin. To talk, we're going to talk about the ethical foundation of Jesus, of uh, Jesus' ministry. I thank you all for your forbearance with me as I stumbled through my uh, my tiredness and exhaustion. But I wanted to make sure that I did this because I've been looking forward to it, even in the midst of my tra I travel. I hope it's been helpful. I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hendricks, so much. And thanks to all of you for your attendance tonight. In a few days, the recording of this session will be sent to your email addresses and can also be found on the Hood Theological Seminary YouTube channel. So we'll look forward to seeing you next Monday, February the 12th, and you will receive a reminder with the Zoom link a few days prior to your session, until to the session. Until we meet again, blessings and shalom to each of you again. Dr. Hendricks, take care of yourself. We're going to hold you in prayer so that you will feel better. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And thank you. Thank you.